It says I'm live. Oh, it doesn't look like, oh, hang on. What's going on with my, my camera? Let's see. That's so weird. Can you guys see me in full or am I mini you? Please tell me in the chat. Um, what happened here? Hmm, hopefully, please tell me in the chat what's going on with my camera picture. Can you guys see it? Um, mini, mini, oh man, this webinar jam platform, what happened? Let's try this. It's good for you. Okay, maybe it's because um, I just jumped on by my side. Okay, so um, to me, it looks like it's really, really tiny, which is totally fine. I don't need to see a giant version of myself on the camera, right? Uh, okay, cool, Amy says fine, fantastic, all right. So um, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. This is our um, Pets Plus Live Beyond the Pages of the Magazine, where we talk about the coolest store. And we haven't had one of these interviews in a while just because of all of the craziness that is happening, um, craziness that is happening with um, COVID-19 and small businesses and people figuring out how to work from home and teach the kids from home. And so we've had a little bit of a delay, but we're back. And today I've got a very awesome special guest. And um, he's one of his store, Rocky and Maggie's in Houston, Texas, was featured in uh, the April and May issue of Pets Plus. I don't have a copy here to show you um, because I think it got lost in the mail, but um, I've got a bunch of copies here, years and years of copies of magazines because it is one of the best, if not the best, I should say, um, pet industry magazine in or around. They win awards constantly. And I hope that you were smart enough to apply for America's coolest pet store um, for this upcoming year, because I think it's the next issue. They're gonna announce this year's winner of the whole America's coolest store. And that person's gonna get their picture on a cover of the magazine. How cool is that? And you'll be able to come on the um, interview and be interviewed also, which is always a lot of fun. So these shows are for you. They're, they're, they're a fun way for you to get to meet the store owners. To It's in the July-August issue. Um, as Pam says, it's in the July-August issue. It's going to be announced. And um, this is the time for um, you guys to be able to, if you're catching it live, to chat in the comments with us and um, ask questions of the, the business owner that's here. Or if you're watching a replay, you can always comment below the video. But um, today, what I'm excited about is we have Bill Klein is going to be jumping on here in just a second. And his store, Rocky and Maggie's, was named after his two beloved dogs in 2012. This Houston-based boutique offers everything from healthy foods and treats to some of the coolest apparel, toys, and accessories around. In addition to those staples for every pet parent, you know, they actively curate a collection of really unique products sourced from all over the world. And on the service side of things, they are in a 40-story high-rise, which I can't wait to learn more about that. And it's downtown and what's known inside the loop in Houston. They offer spa styling, grooming services, and other concierge services to all of the residents in that building as well as the surrounding area. Well, Bill, I would love for you to come join us. Uh, we need to hear more about the store. How are you? Good, how are you? Uh, good, good. So let's start with what is going on right now with your business and COVID? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, uh, yeah, it's only up from here. Um, uh, you know, we, we actually, we just uh, reopened our retail uh, uh, with uh, the uh, announcement from Governor Abbott in Texas, uh, stating that retail can start opening slowly at 25%. So uh, along with the legislative change, uh, the uh, ordinance change, we, uh, we opened. Um, grooming we held off on because of the close contact and the uh, trying to figure out how we were going to transition from the pet owner uh, taking custody safely and then taking the dog in and cleaning the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been shuttered for some time for grooming, uh, but thankfully we're just getting back to that this Friday. We've put in a whole bunch of different processes uh, to uh, safeguard our staff as well as our dogs and uh, uh, the people that uh, we uh, were serving. Um, and hopefully all of that will be good enough to, uh, to allow us to open safely and to, uh, to start business again. 
Yes, yes. And what an amazing business it is. So let's start by you know telling us how the how Rocky and Maggie's even came about. Sure. Um, so uh, long story short, my wife and I were in LA uh, killing some time while we were doing uh, fertility stuff. And uh, we went to Beverly Hills and we we're walking around uh, just window shopping mostly uh, with our dog Rocky. And uh, at the time we didn't have Maggie with us. Uh, she, she wasn't uh, around yet. Um, but uh, we went and we took Rocky to, uh, to this boutique that we happened to stumble up at, uh, upon. And in there, while I'm sitting there, bored out of my mind, my wife is shopping for uh, top hats and treats, uh, uh, little pads for the dog, for the, uh, for the hotel room, all these things. And by the time we were done, four other people had come in and out of the store, bought uh, you know, some, some Origin or Cana products, so we bought some, uh, some other uh, accessories, brought, bought a, a T-shirt, and they're all leaving with uh, three and four figure uh, receipts. And I said, this is a pretty cool business. And so I started talking to the owner about it. And uh, you know, a after doing some research, I found that the pet industry in general is, is a pretty good place to be. It's, it's fairly recession resilient. Um, I say that tongue in cheek right now. I, I need to find some wood to knock on. But, um, you know, I, I think that in general, it's, it's, a, it's a unique business because everybody that came in the store was smiling uh, the moment that they came in the store. Uh, the transaction is nice and easy um, and, and uh, it seems fairly lucrative. So I said, well, that sounds like a good business to try out. So I did. Yeah. And so how, short, how quickly after that visit did you open the store? Um, probably about seven months or so. Okay. Um, we opened the store, so we we started by you know coming up with a, a name. Um, we came up with uh, Top Dog, this, that, the other, you name it. And uh, I said, well, you know, what what other could, thing could we, could we do to make it catchy? And they said, well, you know, my wife came up with the name. And said, uh, why don't you just name it after our dogs, Rocky and Maggie? And so we had just adopted Maggie from uh, one of the local rescues in Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's that's how we came up with the name. We, the, the funny thing is, is that uh, everybody thought it was amazing, except one of my old CEOs thought I had mistakenly opened up an Italian restaurant, which he had done and failed at and didn't like it. He said, Bill, before you open an Italian restaurant like Rocky and Maggie's, you got to call me. I said, it's a pet store. He's like, oh, thank you. That is, that's funny. It, it could totally be uh, an Italian restaurant too. And yeah, a restaurant business is not easy, not easy, but neither is retail, I suppose, and, and, nor grooming, right? Actually, any any small business when you're, you know, in charge and running it, there's a lot of ups and downs and roller coasters. So yeah. were you um, really ready to step into this uh, journey as a entrepreneur in the pet space? Or did you have experience before this um, with, with um, leading companies? Well, um, I, I hadn't been in the retail space in a long time uh, since uh, since it wasn't really a career path, but more of just uh, something I was doing in college. And uh, in between that uh, time, I had done a lot of work in the medical device space, uh, a lot of outbound selling, uh, sales coaching, uh, things like that, a little operational efficiency, um, working with small companies, big companies, alternate care and fusion type places. And uh, so nothing to do with um, dogs. Um, but in my former life in, in college, I had worked at a veterinary hospital in Brooklyn for a few years. And I also worked in a laboratory uh, where we cared for animals. And so, you know, between those two places, I had some great experiences and a, a degree in biology. I, I took all of that and somehow I found my way back to, I could actually use a little bit of my education and uh, prior experience uh, for this. Yeah, yeah. and. Um... You are also on a, a hit TV show. We haven't mentioned that, but a little couple. And you've had 14 seasons of that, which is amazing. I mean, really, really impressive. Uh, congratulations. Um, I always thought it might be fun to have a reality show for um, a pet business owner, actually, because mm -hmm. then... <laughs> then you know all the drama that goes on in the grooming salon and with mm -hmm. you know, even customers and employees and like the crazy dogs who come in it could be a good show so maybe that could be a spin-off show for you but yeah uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's uh, uh, enough drama in our current show but there's definitely enough drama in a, a, a pet store right right <laughs> um, and, and I know when we were emailing I said oh gosh I have a burning question to ask you and is it is it harder to be a reality star or is a retail store owner well, you know, uh, the, the, the easy part about being a, a, on reality is that um, it's pretty much just you. If you're likable and you do it on TV, easy. If you're a jerk, you do it on TV, 
same thing. Um, but running a business is definitely much more stressful. Um, I, I'm responsible for people, their livelihoods, their careers, their safety, all those things. The, the, our clients, I want to make sure that they're taken care of and that we're doing the very best that we can for them. Um, I have my family to support. And uh, to a lesser degree, because I also have a, a successful uh, uh, better half. So um, the pressure isn't quite as much on me, but it is on me for my for my team. And so uh, I take that very seriously. And um, and whereas if you've ever watched my show, you really shouldn't take me very seriously there. <laughs> I love that. I think even in uh, the article, I don't know if it was the Pets Plus article or another article I was reading about how during the interview process, sometimes people get surprised um, after after they're getting into the phase and then they meet you and they're like, oh yeah, I watched you on TV. Yeah, yeah, it, it happens uh, It happens a lot, um, which I'm surprised that they don't either pick me out or, or haven't watched the show because, you know, I only stand four feet tall. So, you know, I, I stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, well, well um, you've clearly been successful in a variety of careers here and you have even another business too, right? Call, it's a, it's a PP pad uh, product, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Rocky uh, isn't all roses. Let's put it that way. Um, Rocky's a my Chihuahua. That's uh, the first half of our namesake, and um, uh, we got Rocky in two thousand seven, and he's been uh, aiming for furniture ever since uh, inside our home. Uh, so, you know, we, we've tried everything. I've done professional training. I've done you know uh, downloadable type training. I've done you know webinars. Nothing works. Um, so a, a bunch of years ago, while I was on a conference call, much like this, um, I uh, saw my dog micturating on our chair leg. And so I put a, a pet training pad underneath it. And I, at least I didn't have to clean the floor anymore, but it was still kind of gross. So uh, we took that to the next step and I came up with this idea of something disposable that you wouldn't have to uh, clean up after. And, um, and it wound up working. So we made a prototype and put it on the floor and Rocky went right to it. And now we manufacture this thing called the pop-up pee pad. It's a, a pen pee pad where you unfold it. And as it unfolds, it pops up from the center and it gives the dog a, a target to aim for. Um, so dogs oftentimes, you know, male dogs, if you have a pheromone or a tractant on the pad, they'll go to the pad, but they'll pee on the corner of the pad. They'll stand on the pad and pee off the pad. They do all sorts of things, but not pee in the middle of the pad, mostly because they just don't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. But they do understand that if they lift their leg and aim for it and stand right up against it, it'll it'll go in that direction. So uh, it, it winds up being a really simple product that works really, really well, like 85, 90 percent of the time. Yeah, that that's that's really interesting. And has that business um, been impacted by COVID? Well, you know, because we manufacture our product abroad, like most companies, um, you know, we were concerned, of course, at first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess the inside track that I have in China is that my because my son's from there, um, my understanding of customs there for a small business that just started is a little bit more advanced than, you know, I would say anybody else that's as green as I am, only manufacturing for a few years there. So uh, my relationships with our factory is actually really, really good. Um, and they have a component that also manufactures in the U.S. So uh, between those two factory locations and our relationships, it hasn't been quite so tenuous. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll see what happens as time goes on, because uh, while our product hasn't been slowed down uh, in shipping, I don't know if trade relations will have a, a, a more lasting impact mm -hmm. as we start to hopefully emerge from uh, uh, this initial outbreak and, uh, and trying to deal with uh, the, the politics between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, with those products, are they available at wholesale or just direct to consumer? Um, no, we, we do D to C through Rocky Maggie's in Houston, um, but we also do uh, wholesale products. So we sell to independents around the country. Uh, we sell to some regional chains. We uh, are at Amazon, a couple of other uh, web places. Um, we have a great uh, map enforcement. My brother is uh, my map enforcer, which is he's also my partner and he's also our our GC. So he loves to uh, uh, to bother people with uh, stern letters. <laughs> That's awesome. Good nice family business there. Did your kids get to spend much time at, at Rocky and Maggie's? You know, well, now we live in Florida. We've lived in Florida for like three years. And um, uh, when we do get to go back, we, we go back to the store, of course. Uh, we did our first uh, Christmas 
um, in our new location, which is in the 40 story high rise, mm -hmm. um, we, we did, we did a, a big Christmas bash had, uh, you know, six or 700 people there. Santa Claus was a, a friend of mine from Galveston that, uh, uh, just sucked it up and put on a Santa suit. Um, and he was not very pleased and I, there's nothing I could have given him to compensate him for it, but, uh, but it was really, really fun seeing him with 600 kids on his lap. Yeah. I mean, I would say that when we did pictures with Santa at my pet store, maybe a hundred, 125 people came through. I yeah. can't imagine 600 to 700. I mean, how do you, how do you crowd control that? Or is it over a whole week? What? Uh, it was out of control, but you know, it, the, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of people, but it's normally not a, uh, a big ticket spend kind of thing when you're going to see Santa and you're bringing your kids and all that stuff. So it was more of just fun. Um, so people were lingering for a long time and were probably a, a, a fire marshal uh, hazard for, for moments at a time there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's more just fun. We used to do, uh, 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 what the heck were we doing there? It was some, some uh, it, it's an egg that's uh, decorated for a Mexican uh, uh, holiday and people were throwing them all around the store and they have confetti inside of them. The place was covered in confetti for six months, which was a lot of fun, but uh, I think we lost money that day. Yeah. But yeah, you know, not, not every marketing plan is a good one. Yes. Well, you know, I think we've all had that, uh, you know, but at least you tried, you know, you try and you learn and then you go, okay, what worked really well? Let me do more of that. And what didn't work so well? And we won't do that yeah. again. So Jim's got a great question here as well as um, looks like we've got someone asking and Lewis is asking too. I mean, you're, you're an independently owned store, right? Or are you part of a chain? I uh, know we're an independently owned store. Okay. And Jim is curious. And so am I too, right? Like what makes Rocky and Maggie's um, unique compared to other stores in Houston? Well, uh, you know, compared to other stores in Houston, I would say that our uh, accessory line is probably much more robust than most of the other stores there. Something that we focused on early on um, when the dynamics of the pet business and retail anyway were, uh, as I described when I first was uh, gained inter interest in it, um, was kind of accessory focused. Lots of sweaters and hats and things like that back in 2012. And things, of course, have transitioned to uh, natural products, sustainable products. Some some things have uh, continued to improve, um, but you'll you know the 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 spending shift to millennials and uh, uh, to to younger generations is is starting. You're starting to see a difference in the prioritization of product. So mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that makes us a little bit more unique is also our nimbleness. Uh, when we see a trend uh, fading, uh, we move away from it. We don't try and uh, keep that relationship going just for the sake of keeping it going and, and watching our products die on the vine or, uh, you know, collect dust in our store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and you've mentioned too, that you um, have source, have some unique places to source products. Cause you, tra you travel around the world a lot. Or are you going to other shows? Like, so one of the things that we found was uh, a really great uh, resource for us was um, going to interzoo. Uh, we started going to interzoo in 2016. Uh, maybe 2014. Um, it, it was it was a, a great experience for us. When we went the first time, it was strictly for the pet store. So I, I had uh, I didn't have any other business uh, in in the pet space, and we were strictly looking for uh, products that weren't in the U.S. Uh, at that point. Um, I'm a big fan of European style. I don't know why. I you know I think my first trip to Europe, I was in my 30s, but um, but I, I I like stuff from Italy. I like German stuff. I you know, I like German cars. I, I, I'd like to have one. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that the uh, uh, the appeal uh, of going to a place like that is you get to see uh, a much broader uh, uh, scope of, of products that are being offered, some of which might not ever fly in the U.S. And, you know, that's where you make some mistakes. And I have a couple of products that uh, that didn't sell very well that we had procured I thought would go well. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are some things that you just don't see here, Italian leathers from, you know, Northern Italy, which up until recently were, uh, you know, something you'd want to bring into the country. And now, now of course, we'll have to wait a little bit before we can get stuff out of there. Uh, but uh, Northern Italy is a great place to source product from, and they have their uh, uh, complimentary show every other year uh, in uh, Northern Italy, in uh, is it Florence or one of those uh, Northern towns. I haven't been to that show, but the interview show is really, really helpful to see what's out there and some things that maybe your competitors won't be able to carry because they didn't go. Right. And is it expensive to have it all shipped to you though? 
No, and you know, oftentimes the uh, the logistics are a lot more scary than what what they really are. Yeah. Uh, the process is fairly streamlined to uh, work with either freight forwarders for larger shipments, uh, or to work with uh, organizations that can help you uh, move the product through customs and into your uh, into your store. A lot of times, you can you know purchase product and just have it uh, uh, coded CIF, which is all the way to your door. Um, it depends on you know obviously the, the the logistics and the need and all that fun stuff and what you're shipping. Uh, the uh, VAT taxes uh, from Europe, uh, you know, are are sometimes scary. But normally, if you work with your uh, partners there, uh, it can be shared uh, to the degree uh, that uh, that it's going to make it prohibitive to sell in the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was Jan's follow-up question. There was just you know how to keep the freight cost down to to make it. Um, still something your customers would want to buy. And, and I think that just good relates to who's your type of customer, right? Do you have a high end customer who is going to be, you know, attracted to more of that Northern Italy leather and the higher price points, or do you have a very price conscious customer? Um, and, and for you being in a high rise in, in downtown, probably a lot of working professionals, right? So tell us sure. more about your store and, and uh, I guess, We'll talk about the location in a second, but since we're talking about products, and it seems like there's other product questions too right now, like sure. um, talk more about the product mix, but as it relates to the type of customer that you have. Sure. Um, so we have a variety of different customers in Houston. We have uh, uh, the full scope of uh, um, uh, income levels, uh, interest, um, types of dogs, activity levels. Um, you know, inside the loop of Houston, we have. Uh, people coming in all the time for uh, restaurants and work and all that sort of fun stuff. But Houston's a pretty big place. It stretches mm -hmm. out for miles. And so our customer base comes from all over the place. Um, and so we'll see customers that come into the city uh, for work and they'll drop their dog off for grooming or stop on their way out for dog food uh, out to uh, a suburb. Or uh, they'll call downstairs uh, from up in the, uh, the high rise and say, hey, I'm running out of dog food. Uh, you know, Fido just finished the last of it. Please bring over back. And so between those two uh, types of customers, we have, uh, you know, all of the different uh, interests that we try to serve. So we have, you know, collars and leashes for sports teams. We have hand knit sweaters. We have uh, custom uh, uh, apparel made for uh, uh, wiener dogs versus, uh, you know, a, a, a super petite uh, teacup, something or other. Um, so we're able to source product from manufacturers with specific measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with uh, some of our folks like our uh, uh, sweater uh, manufacturer for different colors and things like that to complement uh, uh, fur color and all that fun stuff. So, um, so we get a little specific with some of the items and then some of the stuff that we have, we just take a gamble on. We were manufacturing uh, uh, dresses. Uh, you know, and it's tough to pick the right size, but uh, we know that normally people are dressing up smaller dogs. And so we uh, we, we try to stick to, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to commit to something, commit to something we know we can spend, sell in volume. And mm -hmm. so we, uh, we try and get products that can fit a couple of different sizes of dogs with a little adjustment. And, uh, and that seems to work out for us, too. So we don't have too much inventory on the shelf just to serve, you know, 20 percent of, uh, of a customer base. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And um, this this high rise that you're in, um, you provide lots of unique services for them too, and um, like you know pet visits, uh, pet walks, right? That you could you'll will you even pick up for their dog if they've got a grooming appointment downstairs? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we we when we first took on the new space, which we moved about uh, three and a half years ago from uh, Rice Village uh, to uh, a place uh, called Highland Village, which is a little bit more uh, shop, uh, boutique shop oriented versus, uh, uh, more of that pedestrian traffic, uh, lots of dresses and restaurants and dress places and restaurants, uh, in Rice Village. And so when we moved to the new location, one of the things that they'd asked us was, uh, the landlord had asked us was, uh, how we would feel about being considered an amenity for their high rise residents, uh, to which of course we were related, you know, the idea that the, uh, uh, the landlord was going to, you know, alert all of our uh, uh, co-tenants um, to our presence and, uh, you know, what we offer and all that fun stuff was great. And then they went and did a video of our store uh, wow. just to share with the residents so that people that were bringing their dogs with them were assured that there were a number of different services in addition to, you know, a, a pet walking area or pet relief station or whatever um, uh, to, to help better care for their pets. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. yeah. So we, we added uh, uh, grooming, pet sitting. Uh, we do uh, pick up and drop off for uh, appointments, for grooming, uh, things like that as well. Do you charge extra for those that, that service to pick up a dog that has a grooming appointment? No, no. If, uh, if you have a grooming appointment and you're uh, in the building or even within uh, walking distance of around us, there's a lot of apartments inside the loop. Uh, we'll, we'll step on over to your place, pick up your dog, get them washed and bring them back. That's great. But yeah. if you're not already doing it for those watching, cause I know like that is, that is an added value. So your grooming prices could be a little bit higher too. If you wanted to do that, you could add it there. Um, because one of the things that you mentioned in the pets plus article that I loved and I would love to talk further about is really that, um, we all only, you know, we all only have so much time available right to us and our time personally has value and we can choose to decide okay like a, a perfect example it made me it made me think of um my fiance joey we're cleaning through the garage um he's built this beautiful house and we're cleaning through the garage and he realizes he has three wheelbarrows i don't know why we have three wheelbarrows but <laughs> he's got three wheelbarrows and he's like i'm gonna take the best parts from all of them and reassemble the best one and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, cause he hates to have to go spend money. He loves to get a good deal. And he hates like throwing something out that's still in decent shape, right? He spends hours trying to figure out how to piece this whole thing together. And then finally it's like, it's all, it's all going to the junkers. We're putting it out. I'm going to go buy myself a new wheelbarrow. It's just not worth my time, right? And, and he's starting to realize, I think that, you know, his time has a lot of value. And so um, to your customers too, and when we think about our all of our pet, parent customers and their schedules, we as pet providers can really look at our own businesses and, and all the services that we can offer to help them save time. Sure, well, and you know, one of the things that, uh, I, I had a friend that I had met um, early on in the pet business and he had originally said to me, you know, I do, he was, he was mostly in doggy daycare. So his business was predominantly uh, just doggy daycare. And he, at, when he first started, he wasn't doing grooming. He said grooming was a necessary evil for uh, the rest of his dog grooming uh, for his uh, pet sitting business because um, he needed to give the dogs baths. And so rather than charge for them as a separate uh, charge, because there was, there was a level of expectation that was higher, if I charge you separately for it, he just threw in baths as part of the process of uh, doggy daycare. And I think for us, uh, instead of it being just a, a thing that we've thrown in, what we've decided uh, our services are in general uh, are to stave off the disaster of uh, becoming uh, a, a dusty old brick and mortar that offers the same things as places online do. Mm -hmm. Services are going to be harder to replace, uh, at least for a while, um, uh, via an Amazon or a Chewy or you know any of those types of uh, e-commerce uh, bohemians. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of our primary reasons for adding pet concierge and pet sitting which was an expansion of what we were doing uh, in uh, Rice Village, where we didn't do that particular service. This made sense in this location for a variety of reasons. One of them being that uh, another revenue stream will keep us from uh, having uh, a retail uh, be so devastating if we see a shortfall. Um, so we're diversifying our vertical so that we can you know, stay afloat uh, when one thing takes a hit. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of, um, small businesses are thinking about that right now, right? Like thinking there's pet sitters who, you know, wish they did have some sort of a dropship program or shipping online or pet sitters who have dog training knowledge, but need to jump into action and maybe start teaching classes online too. Or, you know, retailers whose grooming salons had to be shut, but their retail was able to still stay open. You know, they, in your situation too, you know, it's like there's still an element um, that can be, can be available right now. So yeah, it, it, it's definitely difficult. Um, you know, I, I, I've had conversations with my team uh, regularly throughout this whole, uh, uh, you know, pandemic. And, um, you know, first and foremost is safety. I, I don't say it, uh, you know, as a buzzword. I say it because, you know, there's, there's two primary realities. One is that I, I care about my team. And two is that if my team gets sick, then I don't have a store that's operating. So, you know, one of them is uh, uh, important to me personally, and the other one is important to the business thriving. And I think that if you put together a good process and you have your team go through it carefully uh, and practice it before you go live, uh, you have a much better chance of uh, having success with uh, safety in mind and make it all second nature, just like uh, uh, grooming a dog was beforehand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And so working remotely, I was in communicating with your team, right? I was really surprised when I when I heard that, that you got this store and then you moved to Florida, as you've already mentioned. I know there's some pet bosses in the pet boss club who are maybe up in the East Coast and they're just like, can't wait to get to warmer weather. But I know people often wonder, well, can, do I have to sell my store first to make that happen? Or am I able to work remotely like you're doing? Um, you know, it, it's definitely not as good as being there. Uh, you know, there's just no two ways about it. Um, being uh, hands-on is important. I do it about 10 to 15% of the time. So um, that basically means that I'm on a plane once every, I don't know, six weeks or so, and I'll spend uh, a few days uh, there, and then I'll fly back home. And of course, you know, uh, pro re nada if there's a big problem, you know, if somebody needs me, I'm there on demand. But uh, for the most part, I try and check in once every one and a half months or so. Um, that gives me uh, enough of an understanding of what's going on, a little bit of the dynamic. If you stay around long enough, is there anything going on between people within your team and how can you resolve those issues? Um, normally I come in and it's a whirlwind from, you know, beginning to end. And then I go back home and everybody's uh, very happy. Uh, <laughs> and then we try to take care of all the things that, uh, you know, that we glazed over in my haste. But, um, but you know, working remotely is more about communication and continuing to drill that in as a, uh, a fundamental part of, uh, of your day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can find time, if you have, uh, you know, most people run pretty lean as far as uh, staff is concerned uh, for, for understandable reasons, and we do as well. So I, I sometimes find it difficult to get my staff to have enough time uh, to get on the phone with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just call back regularly throughout the day and we'll have a conversation in piecemeal. Right. Um, but you know, you do what you have to do. Right, yeah, because they have to stop and help a customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want them to ignore the customer for me. Yeah, exactly. And um, I also think in the Pets Plus article, you mentioned that you have a spreadsheet that managers update regularly and then you're checking that. Yeah, day. so um, one of the things that uh, I took from one of my old jobs when we had, you know, millions of sell, uh, dollars in sales and you know hungry, crazy sales guys from old insurance companies was this competitive uh, data of you know uh, sales, sales data for all of us. So you could see where you were uh, ranking and where your uh, competitors were. And, um, and I, I brought a little bit of that. I didn't make it quite as cutthroat as uh, those, those old days were. But um, what's important is that we all understand where the numbers are at. Uh, I can't have an expectation for people to do better or to increase sales or to sell a particular line of product if I don't tell them where they're at. And so establishing an understanding of what we're doing, how their behaviors are influencing our uh, sales, our uh, relationships with our customers. We do uh, customer exit interviews with the little you know, smiley faces and you know, any other attributes that they want to add or suggestions they have for us. So we're constantly asking for information from our clients. We talk uh, internally, and of course, you know, we want everybody to continue to communicate. So the more data, the better. Yeah, exactly, because if, we're, if you're not measuring it, you don't know what to improve on. And as the saying goes, right, what you measure grows. Um, and so it's a, good, it's a good baseline to start at. And I do find, at least you know, in when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people in their businesses is that, um, yeah, their point of sales systems tracking, uh, daily sales, um, maybe even, you know, in a perfect world, they'd be even tracking like, uh, you know, sales associate sales, right? Having the team member um, log in under their username. But oftentimes they're not looking back and analyzing that information. Or if there is a custom spreadsheet like you have, just because the, the day gets away from you, like you said, you know, you're wearing a lot of hats and, and the last thing you think that's important is to go back and update a spreadsheet. But it is truly uh, has a lot of value and can empower you to then make the next best decisions for your for your business. Sure. And, and one of the things that, you know, isn't uh, something you can derive from your POS or operating system or accounting system is the activity part. The, the stuff that um, uh, is related to how many phone calls did you make to grooming clients to see who's going to get back on the calendar? Mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, what, what's the status of the POs that you needed to issue for this week? So, you know, are, are they in route? Have we issued the POs? What's the dollar amount? What's my cash flow looking like? And some of that stuff, of course, is, you know, able to be generated by the system, but some of it is implied. I know that I placed my order on Tuesday and it should be there on Thursday, but if, uh, if it's anything other than a big distributor, uh, they'll probably be shipping via FedEx or UPS ground and, you know, who knows? Um, so if we want to manage our clients' expectations, 
we want to know what data uh, is available for us to uh, retrieve that information to pass it on to the client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, also thinking about um, some of the bells and the whistles I feel like that you have there is you you got your you know you have an online store and you've shared that you've had an online store since day one. Um, so I'd love to learn more about that because I'm sure that that has helped and during COVID-19 too. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so we started off with a company called Volusion, which is one of the big e-commerce platforms. It's a uh, kind of out of the can. And I'm sure uh, most of uh, the folks that uh, own pet stores uh, here, uh, you know, have either heard of or used Animal Supply. And before uh, our local branch of Animal Supply was Animal Supply, it was Lone Star. Lone Star had a backend that uh, one guy was able to program uh, data to uh, basically an API uh, between their backend system and my website. And I wanted to sell online. So, uh, so I paid this gentleman to uh, create this portal and uh, the data started flowing and we started selling product online. And, uh, and it, it was being drop shipped from the, uh, my partner at Lone Star. So I didn't have to touch anything. So it was basically, as long as I, you know, uh, did uh, enough e-commerce marketing, uh, web marketing, uh, we would start to see some activity. And so we, we started seeing activity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not nearly as well as I, I'd like it to be, but, you know, nothing ever is, right? Um, but uh, but it's, doing, it's doing pretty well. And we moved from Volusion, which was a little uh, more difficult for me to manage as an individual, to big commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a good product for a while. But one of the things that's a buzzword that a lot of people talk about recently is uh, omni-channel marketing. And, uh, and that's something that I've been interested in for a while, mostly because I, um, I have a problem with uh, control of uh, uh, entering data. Um, I like to do a lot of that stuff uh, personally, or at least to figure it out until I can deliver it to some of our team. Um, but that being said, uh, it, it's, it's a, a bear to exchange information back from your QuickBooks point of sale system to, uh, you know, your, sh your, your big commerce, uh, e-commerce platform to keep your uh, inventory correct. So moving to Shopify, which wound up having a, uh, a POS uh, that, you know, was tablet based, uh, some backend features that you could work with, apps from third parties that could make anything happen. And, uh, and then being able to integrate with social media, being able to integrate with your e-commerce page, eBay, Amazon, Walmart, you name it, any other place that you wanted to post your products, you could and potentially garner some revenue. Um, especially if you have short dated product, things that you want to dump, if you know, you don't want to sell on Amazon or Walmart, but you do want to get rid of the things that you need to get off of your plate. Um, it, it's like the old version of an excess and obsolete company. Um, it's a nice way to wholesale out your product and get your dollars back in the door so that you have resources for other, uh, to invest elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and all the systems kind of work together so I don't have to manage it. <laughs> You're removing the friction. You're removing yep. all the friction to make it easier to save you time, right? Your time's valuable. Yep. And and also those removing that friction also, I'm sure, removes the um, potential for human error, yep. right? Yep. Uh, so, and, and has online been a good source of revenue for you? Or is it something? Um, you know, I think it's about 15 to 20% of our revenue on a regular uh, month. Uh, right now, it's about 90% of our revenue. Yeah. Uh, so we've seen, we've seen a shift of, of some of our in-store purchases to online. We've had some of our customers that live everywhere except for uh, within the building that will place orders and just have them shipped to their, uh, to their uh, house. And so we're seeing some of that transition away, which you know you, you see on, on uh, every news channel, the talk about how the new normal might be more e-commerce based, which of course scares a lot of us as uh, brick and mortar owners. Um, so, you know, I, I do see some of that transition. I'm hoping that uh, because there's the service uh, component to it, that even if they like the luxury of having a 50 pound bag of dog food dropped off at the door, that they'll still come in and uh, get their dog groomed uh, by us. But mm -hmm. we do have a couple of ideas just in case that starts to uh, go away. <laughs> yeah, and um, Sandy had a question on here just about how you combat your customers buying from Amazon and Chewy versus you. So do you, do you feel like, from the, the people who shop in the store that you still are fighting that conversation? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there used to be, uh, you know, as independents and I'm sure most of the folks that are, you know, watching are, 
um, there used to be a, a, a kind of a dividing line, especially in food, uh, where, you know, you can find that stuff in a big box store. And so, you know, even carrying blue buffalo a few years ago wasn't really a, 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 a taboo thing because, you know, it was a mainstream product, but you couldn't get it everywhere. Um, you could buy it in a big box store, but, you know, not, not Amazon and over at Publix or HEB or whatever part of the country you're in that, uh, that supermarket. Um, so I think the, there's two, two parts to it. One is uh, you have to manage your pricing pretty aggressively no matter what. If Amazon or Chewy's not reducing their pricing, um, it's your competitor that's the independent down the block that's chasing someone. And, um, and so I think that as long as we're sticking to map pricing, we do our best to uh, support our partners, our vendor partners, um, you know, those partners will hopefully stay uh, with the independents and support those folks. But to the degree that you need to uh, get, get down and dirty because there's just no choice, um, then you have to take a look at what other ways you can optimize your operation so that the costs that typically would bury an independent to uh, administrate those things um, reduce. So, you know, if you can reduce your shipping costs, if you can work with uh, drop shippers and squeeze out a few points and then dollar cost average your entire sale, where you have some higher profitable items, some lower profitable items, but you incent them to purchase those products from you. And even from Amazon, you can set uh, minimums for free freight that aren't uh, obnoxious, but still encourage people to buy more than just, you know, one uh, chew toy. Right, right. And um, even I noticed on your website, too, that your minimum order for free shipping is $75. Is that correct? Yeah. Which, which I think seems higher than what most people feel like they need to do. They, feel, they may feel like they have to do, you know, $50 or even $25 for free with free shipping. Yeah, you know, so there's there's a couple of different ways that we've played with, and I'm not sure that 75 is where we'll land forever either. Um, you know, I think um, the trends continue to change as far as how people perceive freight to be, uh, a, a, you know, something that we're making money off of uh, versus a cost center for most businesses, including the the bigger stores. Um, you know, I would I would implore everybody to negotiate with uh, you know your your carriers, pick a carrier that you can. Um, uh, swear a little bit more allegiance to and uh, and then push everything you can from a volume perspective through it. That's your biggest cost as far as uh, absorbing um, uh, the freight. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, having a good uh, mixed product will certainly help uh, get your number up there, but also uh, to defray the, the cost uh, of, of shipping. If you ship a, a 30 pound bag of origin for 70 bucks and um, you're paying $20 in freight and you're making 25%, 30% on it, which is pretty standard for everybody. You know, you're, you might be break even maybe. Um, and then you still have to ad admin the whole thing. So you have a person picking, packing, shipping, putting that box together and the cost of the box. Um, so if, if you can find ways of jumping into e-commerce a little bit more all in or treat yourself like you are all in, mm -hmm. um, negotiate like a, like a, a bigger uh, entity, uh, it'll probably pay dividends and you can explain that you're starting, but you're heading towards a bigger place. And a lot of people will, uh, will work with you in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I also just encourage everyone to think about that. This is you know, having an online store to really ship product from is it's like its own whole separate business model. You've got to be paying attention to how you're driving as much, you know, driving traffic to the website and then even how the website is set up, you know, that you've got to have the, the other products of interest that pair so that you can upsell and get them to upsell and add on um, following up with marketing emails for abandoned carts. And, you know, I mean, there, there's a whole strategy to online stores that, um, that that's like a whole nother business to have to manage. It is. And, uh, you know, thankfully uh, for uh, fools like me, they've come out with a lot of apps that um, do a lot of this work through automation. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an example, abandoned carts, um, you can set abandoned cart uh, reminders and follow ups uh, to be automated for, you know, hours, days after um, you can set it programmatic to do different messages for different times uh, after. I think it's a it's, it's definitely a, a quick way to. Uh, compete at a at a at a in a in a way that doesn't make it so taxing on you as a an owner, or doesn't compel you to have to hire an IT person to run that component of your business. Uh, 
in addition to all the other things that need to be done to get a box out the door. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things I noticed on your site is that you allow people to book grooming appointments. Yeah. Um, I think that that oftentimes is also kind of something that a lot of retailers don't want to move forward with because there's so many intricacies to actually booking the time appropriately for the dog and the groomer with the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'll, I'll probably make this story too long, but uh, one of one of the things that I was obsessed with when in my old selling days was uh, having data available. So if I called a client, I wanted to know what I sold to them. So I didn't sound like a fool when I, you know, spoke to them. You know, I don't want to ask them about something that they just bought and say, do you want to buy it? And uh, and so integrating data was always a big thing for me. And up until sales, Salesforce.com came around, uh, it was hard to do anything unless it was custom. Um, so I started building access databases that integrated uh, operational data with contact data so that I could leave notes, I could record voicemails, I could take a look at sales history, all point and click without leaving one screen. And this is kind of that next evolution where you're, you're, you're not just omni-channel, but you're serving uh, your product and your services through that same platform, which allows your customer to have one account, one sign-on, one way to manage everything, one place to find all their receipts, all their transactions, all their history. And so they have access to it. We have access to it. So, you know, from a pricing perspective, if you charge the customer 75 bucks because the dog was a little bit more matted than you had expected, and this time you want to give a little bit less, well, you can look back and see what those numbers were without having to dig through files or run a sales history report or anything like that. Just look at the customer and you know, look at their account history and it's right there. Um, but the nice part is, is from the web perspective, people have the ability to manage their appointment online. They don't have to pick up the phone if they don't want to, which this day and age, despite my encouraging people to use the phone for what it was meant to be used for, <laughs> nobody wants to talk on the phone anymore. Yeah. Well, and even sometimes when we hire younger people who just don't have the experience of even growing up with a phone in their house anymore, um, you know, teaching them to be confident on the phone even is is part of needs to be part of their training process. Well, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, one of the things that I used to do also was sales training. Um, I, I've trained some of the some of the bigger companies in healthcare and you know, a lot of people think that it's like uh, Babe Ruth. You know, you step up at the plate and you smack a home run and that's just the way it is. Um, the reality is, is that, that if you want to grow your sales in a meaningful way that you can count on, you have, to, you have to rely on the process, not on the sales. So, you know, while it's great to give accolades to people that, you know, uh, we, had, we had a sale yesterday. I think it was just over $1,000 and we had not been open for, you know, very long. And I was kind of surprised about the sale. I was, you know. Uh, doing a couple of Hail Marys there. Yeah. And, uh, you <laughs> That's know, something we'll you know, a couple days. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, not something I had expected, you know, as we're dusting off the front door handle and telling everybody to wear a mask as they come in. Um, so, so you know, I think the, the thing is, is while it's great to give praise for those, those big individual moments, um, relying on a process is really what will get you to where you want to be. Um, and it's something that I, I, I still battle with because it's hard to encourage people uh, to do it. Um, you know, you should do it yourself to show people uh, mm -hmm. how it's done and that you're not afraid to do it. Um, so to that degree, working remotely sometimes is a little bit more difficult to, uh, to prove those things. But the process is really what's, what, what I think drives success. So uh, if you make 20 phone calls a day and two of them close and that's a 10% ratio and you need to do double the sales, how many calls do you need to make tomorrow? Exactly. <laughs> well, the, the um, and I even go back to the website too. I think it's like you need like a thousand, maybe traditionally in websites, you need like a thousand visitors to your website for one purchase. Yeah. I don't know if that's been the same, but it's, you know, it's all the data, right? It's that, it's that data that you're collecting to know that, you know, it's a numbers game. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, you know, they, they, the sales funnel idea is predicated on activity. It starts with activity and everything else just kind of falls into line. There's a certain number that are interested, a certain number of those people that are wind up buying and so on and so forth. That's right, that's right. Um, on that and attracting people, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So I've got a couple questions in here and if those of you who are watching live want to get your question in about anything we've talked about, please drop it in the comments here. And But on the traffic piece of it, there have been a couple questions on what type of marketing have you done that has worked the best for your business? 
Sure. Um, so there's there's probably two different things that we've focused on more recently. Um, we've done we've done everything. Um, or not, probably not everything, but I'll, I'll say that we've done a lot. Um, we've done uh, Val packs. We've done newspapers. We've done uh, television ads. We've done uh, integrations with uh, 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 local morning shows in Houston. Um, we've done sponsored events. Um, I did a, a doggy fashion show that was actually on our TV show. It was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, we were in uh, Discovery Green, a big park in the middle of uh, Houston. We had hundreds of people there. We had dogs walking a, a little, uh, uh, what do you call it, the runway. runway. The, and the music and all that stuff. And the, the, the person that uh, she, she's the host of Great Day Houston, Deborah Duncan, was our MC for the night. She was awesome. She made everybody laugh. I acted like a fool. It was great, though. So we've done just about everything, you know. And don't be afraid to be a fool. I have a friend that sends me all of his videos of acting like a fool in front of his restaurants right now trying to get business. Um, but, you know, we've tried everything. I think the things that we've seen the most success with, uh, managing your email database very well, so getting inbound subscribers for email um, to, uh, to, to serve those folks through information and deals and, uh, you know, you know, uh, all that sort of fun stuff. And then uh, social. I mean, you know, it, it's here to stay. Don't don't uh, don't be afraid of it. It's not just for you to communicate with uh, family and friends anymore. It is a fantastic tool to get out there. Um, you know, we get a, a tremendous amount of our referrals for our website through social. Um, Instagram and Facebook are by and by far the biggest players uh, right now. Um, you know, there are, of course, plenty of other people that are coming up. TikTok's one that I'm still trying to stay away from. Um, but, uh, you know, my better half is into social more than I am, actually. And uh, she does it on her own. I, I'm, I'm terrible. So my staff is happy to do most of that stuff. We take pictures in the store. Um, reality is actually, I know it sounds stupid coming from me, but reality is a good thing for social media. So, you know, less of the polished and more of the, the real, you know, the dog. Uh, interactions playing lifestyle stuff uh pictures that are in your store are great pictures with you guys are great um those things get the most eyeballs it gets the most uh, uh comments it gets the most interaction and of course that turns into revenue eventually yeah absolutely and um, that was what brian was asking too if you used facebook or instagram but it sounds like you're using both oh yeah facebook instagram you name it anything i can mm -hmm. uh, twitter we use we use uh, pinterest um uh, we we are just starting to get into using YouTube, which we're probably ten years too late on. But I know, right? Well, they say you know it's like with YouTube right now too. They say that with everyone staying home, everyone's wanting to learn new skills or try new things, and I, like sixty percent of them are obviously going to YouTube for that. So sure. um, it's a good place to be, to be if you create any kind of educational content for your customers. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then I, I love that you said that email marketing too. Um, you know, email marketing isn't dead. Uh, I did a talk on this at Global Pet Expo. Okay, it's still actually the number one um, driver of retail sales, but you have to, um, you know, communicate regularly and with value and segment your list. There's so many things you can do with email and the power of it. But um, what I take really from what you've said there is that you've made it a priority to collect your customers' information. And in a time where, which is more data, right? But yeah. in a time like this, when stores have had to adjust hours or close or switch services or put new rules and stipulations in, if you were a store that didn't make it a priority to collect information, you may have a harder time communicating that the messages you need to. Sure, sure, yeah. You know, um, we're, we're fortunate to have the information that we have. It, some of it's incomplete, of course. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all based on what, what gets put in, you know. Uh, my, my old boss used to say garbage in, garbage out when we were putting data into our old CRMs. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the, the real goal for, you know, for any organization is to really understand your clients. And um, mm -hmm. the way to do that is to ask questions and to keep that information as a reference point for, you know, when something does come up that, uh, you know, that you can help them with. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've made a point of is collecting what people buy as far as dog food's concerned and recording it all. Um, I don't want to retread that information and they might not buy it from me, but if I wind up carrying a product that I didn't carry before, maybe I can convert them with a couple of reports and emails and all of a sudden I've segmented my list of people that buy Blue Buffalo from someone else and now I've, I've got some you know great deal on Blue, well then maybe I can email all those customers and get them to come on in and become new customers.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, as we wrap up here, you had a couple great resources of books that you that you liked uh, that, were, that were helpful. Sorry, in your business, yeah. do you have those in front of you to share? Yeah. So, well, you know, so actually, the one that uh, I'd probably recommend the most is the Who Moved My Cheese book. Um, so, you know, Tom Hopkins, of course, wrote uh, How to Master the Art of Selling. And that one is uh, is great for anybody that's into process selling, you know, understanding your metrics and, you know, and making it uh, a journey, uh, you know, as opposed to just a job that you show up to. Um, but but Who Moved My Cheese was actually a book that was put on my desk. Um, it was a, an odd story. My my company was going through a series of acquisitions. I was 20 something. I was I was, you know, greenhorn. And um, the, the, the book kind of pointed out a couple of things that have stuck with me for the past 20 years. Um, you, you have to anticipate that things will continue to change and you have to be ready to change. You have to accept the fact that things are going to change. And now it's kind of apropos that, you know, we're, we're talking about that particular book because, um, you know, it, it's happening now. People are dealing with change. And whether you like it or not, it, it's going to happen. And you can either, you know, adapt with it or, you know, go into a different industry. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's what a lot of people face uh, right now. So uh, that's a good book to pick up. And it's, uh, it's a really easy read, pretty small, and it's uh, got a cute uh, anecdotal story to it. Yeah, I remember getting that book. I think it was one of our, either it was in college or just after college, it was also given to me too and recommended to read. Um, and I'm not a huge reader, so I did like that it was nice and short. <laughs> I'm more of the, the podcast, audio book, <laughs> multitasking, doing too, you know, doing too many things. Yeah, no, no, it's either that or who said, uh, don't sweat the small stuff is my uh, other favorite tiny book read. All right, awesome. Um, okay, so just a parting words for us. If there was anything that you feel like the pet industry needs to know, what, what, Please tell me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know everything. If I said it, I'd hang up now and say <laughs> full of it. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the pet industry is uh, the industry that I've had the most fun with in my 25 years of working uh, in a career. Um, I, I've been in this business for about eight years and uh, I've opened up another business because I loved it so much. And the, 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 my colleagues at when I go to Global Pet, that I'm, I'm as excited to see my other vendor partners and I'm also excited to see all of my clients. And then I'm excited to be on both sides. I see my vendors as, as a client, I buy from them, um, but they're more also buddies because we're also dealing with the, you know, global pet uh, logistics issues right. that come up as a vendor. And then, you know, as, as a vendor, I get to see all my clients that, uh, that are now buying from us. So it, it, it's an exciting uh, uh, thing to, to, you know, to have that camaraderie in this industry. I don't know that it exists everywhere quite the same way. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you on that. And it's fun too, to see like the whole ecosystem and understand how it all works together too. Well, Bill, thank you so much for being here and congratulations on your, your cool store feature in the Pets Plus magazine um, in, in this last issue. And for all of you for tuning in with us, I know you've got a lot of ways that you could be spending your time in your day and for tuning in and joining us. Um, we appreciate it so much. My name is Candace Daniolo. I'm the founder of Pet Boss Nation and a regular columnist with Pets Plus. And we put on these shows just to give you a chance to kind of go behind the pages. So we will see you very soon, I'm sure, with another one. And everyone else, just um, enjoy uh, the rest of your day and just focus on ways that you can uh, rebuild and rebound because you will recover. Um, if you've built your business to this point, you're going to be able to get through this and, and be even stronger. Right, Bill? <laughs> That's, right. That's right. You'll come back stronger, I promise. Yes, it'll, it'll, everything, everything will be okay. Everything will be okay. All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.